that essence, that soul essence of being that is within each one of us. And one way to do that is through aligning with that inner self. So we'll take this prescription for spiritual alignment, just quietly allow this to move within you, to move with you and feel the energy and the life that is within these words. We are aligned with the presence of God within. We are protected by God's love, wisdom, knowledge, and grace. The God consciousness within helps us discover more about who we are. Thank you, God, for the gift of spiritual intuition. Thank you, God, for aligning our conscious, subconscious, and superconscious minds. And we're just grateful for each other as we align with the Center for Enlightenment within ourselves, within each other, and within all of humanity that pervades the universe and moves and flows within and with each one of us. Let this experience that we have this morning move our consciousness and soul exactly where we need to be. We are open and receptive to this spiritual consciousness, this light, power, energy, and strength. Thank you. Amen. Well, how are you doing this week? You've been working with the soul. We, we read the first chapter of Spiritual Power Tools last week. We talked about the soul and what the soul was. It's a fragment of God that identifies within our own individual being. It is that which we are growing into and evolving into as souls. The truth is, that you are a soul in evolution. And that means that every experience in your life is brought into your awareness to unfold your soul's potential. Last week, we talked about Christmas presents. Jane talks about situations that happen every day in our lives. And she said, every day is Christmas in which we receive something, a gift, and we often don't realize that it's a gift because it can come in uh, packaging or wrappings that we like or we dislike. Some of those Christmas presents that are there to forward our soul's evolution and growth are things that we find pleasant. And other ones we have to dig a little bit. Sometimes they're a little hard to get open, but once we do, those are the most valuable presents of all. But in order to get in touch with the soul evolution that we are and that we have, we have to do something to activate it. How do you quicken or awaken the soul essence within you and move into conscious alignment, spiritual consciousness with your evolving soul? The key is desire. And today we're going to take chapter one, but we're gonna go into the hidden curriculum, the things that aren't written in the words, but are actually taught by Jane as she has taught her students for 30 years, and I've been one of her students for those 30 years. And it really takes the uh, forms of desire and commitment. It takes desire to spark the flame of spiritual consciousness. And in order to begin the journey of conscious awareness, where we consciously are moving on our spiritual path and evolving as spiritual beings, we have to generate that desire. But first of all, what is a desire? A desire is a strongly held wish or hope, a sense of longing or hoping for something to happen. And there's all kinds of desires, lesser desires, desires we might consider good, desires we consider bad. But this morning, we're going to talk about focusing our desires on the one true desire of your heart. The one true desire of your heart is why you're in this class this morning. 
Your desire brought you here because you have a desire for something. Perhaps you call that something enlightenment. Perhaps it's um, awakening or spiritual growth. Perhaps you're experiencing a desire for something that is more of an expression of that, like peace of mind or a sense of well-being and satisfaction with life. Those are also spiritual desires. But if you take all of your spiritual desires, all the desires that will grow you into the potential that you are, what you'll find is they can all be boiled down into one thing. And that is the desire to awaken, the desire for enlightenment, the desire of awakening to your true self. And that's what brought you to this class this morning. So you're seeing already one example of how the desire works in your life to give you the impetus and the strength and, and the push that moves you forward. Why are your desires so important? Well, your desires have a life of their own. I've often said that your spiritual growth is less about what you believe than about what you desire. Because you can believe anything and you may or may not have any strength to it. But a desire has punch. A desire has power. A desire has oomph to it and it moves you forward. And it, it doesn't, um, there's nothing that can hold a desire back. That desire that you're holding right now for your spiritual growth has an energy of its own. It is compelling you to complete it and to move you forward. And yet you have many other desires, lesser desires that also drive you and are never ending. And so each desire, in a sense, demands its fulfillment. Since you have free will, God, the infinite self that we all share, respects your desires and will fulfill each one. It's important for you to think over your desires carefully, therefore, because if all of your desires in the fullness of time get fulfilled, if they're held strongly enough, then what you want to do is have desires that work in the best interest of your soul. Again, that's our topic today, the soul, the soul in evolution that you are. Now, many people, when I've talked to them about generating this desire, this one true desire of their heart, have struggled with it. When I ask people, what is the one true desire of your heart? No matter how much I talk about the spiritual nature and the importance of it, as often as not, I'll hear people say, well, I want to have a, uh, a vacation home, or I want to have a boat, or I want to have, um, I want to retire, uh, different physical things or emotional things, relationship, different things like that. Those desires are fine because you are in form, but the question is, what do you want to put your energy in? What do you want to invest in? It's called in, in traditional religion, the treasure in the field, the pearl of great price, the thing that you're willing to sell everything else for and, and, and let go of everything else to get this one thing. And what is it? Well, we call it enlightenment. This is the center for enlightenment. Other people call it spiritual awakening and growth, but it is the essence of your infinite self your soul at the center of your being. And I'm going to challenge you with the question, what is your greatest heart's desire? Go in there right now. Feel what's in your heart. What is your heart longing for? Not just what do you want today. But if you were really at that point in your life where you have to address it, when you have to look at it, what's in your heart? What is your heart? longing for, yearning for, and desiring. You know, it's no accident that when people have near-death experiences and they're almost forced to have an experience of their soul, their non-physical self, and then they come back into this lifetime, everything changes because they get in touch with the fact that this isn't all there is. The soul is the non-physical, eternal essence of their nature. And so my question to you is, what is the desire of that heart of you? Heart meaning that soul, that essence, that true nature of you. Your heart has a vibration and an energy, all its own. And your heart's desire speaks louder than any words. If you desire to know your infinite self, your soul will fulfill it. The universe will support it. You will get backup 
in ways that are amazing. I found that when I had a time in my life when I truly committed to the deeper journey of my soul, everything shifted. This was in 1987 or so when I was driving with Jane Elizabeth Hart and we were in her car, I was driving and she said, pull over, Greg. And I pulled over, I thought something was wrong. And she turned to me and she said, Greg, what do you want? That was a very strange question. And I just looked at her and then she looked at me again and said, what do you want? And I said, well, I guess what I want is to serve God. You see, I'd been a minister for 17 years at that point because serving God was what I chose to do in life. And she looked at me and she smiled and she said, don't you think you ought to get to know God first? Well, I wasn't insulted because I had so much respect for her, but I was shocked. Here I'd spent all these years teaching about God and learning about God. And what I found out as the months and years afterwards went on was that God wasn't anything like I thought God was. The ideas I had about God in my head and about my soul and about my purpose on living on earth were just a nursery school, first grade stuff. That was when I committed to my soul growth. And I said, yes, I, I, want, I want to know God. And things started changing. I mean, my outer circumstances started changing, but most importantly, the inner circumstances of my soul started changing. So this morning, we're gonna talk about generating a soul's desire, getting in touch with that desire that is already there in your heart. You don't have to come up with it. I know there are people right now thinking to themselves, he's asking me to come up with something, a statement or a desire but you don't have to come up with it out of nothing. There's something within your heart already. It was placed there at the beginning of time. It has followed you and moved with you through all of your incarnations and all of your eons of experiences. And it will always be there. It is what you're growing into the awareness of. Remember what we said last week, which was your soul always was, it always is, it always will be. But what evolves isn't so much the soul as your consciousness of the soul, your awareness of the soul. And so that soul awareness has a desire placed in itself at the very beginning of time. Get in touch with that, what that is right now. And perhaps it helps to think, well, what did I desire when I was younger? I desired to have a career. I desired to be successful, to be famous, to be an astronaut to be in certain types of relationships, to have children or not have children, all kinds of other desires, which are a part of the experience of life. But there was something else that was waiting in the wings, that was waiting behind the curtain. So first get in touch with what desires did you once have and how have those desires changed as you've grown as a personal, as a personality self, you've grown into somebody where you're now at the brink, and perhaps you've been at the you've you've crossed over this line long, long ago, where you're ready to truly commit to the essence of your being, to that soul evolution that is within you, that soul essence which is yearning and pushing and trying to grow. So now my question is: what is your desire in your heart right now? And don't worry about coming up with any words for it, just get in touch with the feeling of it. The first and most important desire to have. You can see how important desire is because desire is what creates everything. Desire is the spark plug that ignites the fuel that moves your soul forward, your experience of your soul forward. If you desire to know your whole self more than you desire anything else, you find out that this spiritual journey does not, is not limited to material goods. I was inspired by a woman 40 years ago in a class who raised her hand and said, I had a, an apartment fire uh, three years ago and I lost everything. And people went, ooh, and that's terrible. And she says, no, thank God for that. I didn't need all that crap and my kids sure didn't want any of it. And she was grinning ear to ear. She got in touch with 
The fact that we're not our material things, we're not our status in the world, we are not our physical shells, we are our soul essence. And there's a lot more to life than that, than those material things. Jane said that there's a, a covering, the personality self is a covering over that essential self. And all our coverings look different. We're all different, you know, sizes and shapes and, and personalities and bodies. But within, it's all one. And our journey, no matter who we are in the fullness of time, is to uncover the truth of our being. Now, how do we accomplish that? How do we get in touch with that truth that is inside of you that is yearning to come out? When I say you have to have a desire, your soul already has that desire and it's holding it for you, holding it in escrow, waiting for you to say, yes, I'm ready to desire to know my eternal, infinite self. And we accomplish this by continually generating this desire. When you discover that self, you find what we call God, infinite love, intelligence, and it's all inside of you. It is so worth every effort that you make, every effort that you make to commit to and to desire that spiritual growth and then relinquish all the lesser desires. I remember Jane telling um, her students about a time in her life where she realized in meditation that she was spending most of her time sewing. She loved being a dressmaker, a dress designer, and she had a realization that she could make this a career. This could be what her life was about. But she also realized she was at a crossroads, that there was a possibility in her life where she could truly double down on her spiritual growth. And all the time she was spending making and designing dresses and things was taking away from what she could be focusing her energy on. And so she set that aside as her primary focus and didn't want to have a split focus in her life. She generated that desire to know her real self. And you know within yourself, deep down, that there is something more. As you look within your soul, you recognize that there's a part of you that wants to know your infinite self, your real self. You might not understand that part of yourself fully. It still might be something that's somewhat unfamiliar to you, or you might have a growing understanding of it. Even if you don't know what it all means, that desire is there. Getting in touch with that desire will begin the process of uncovering your real self. And then you're not alone. You'll find you'll get back up. I found that when I made my deeper commitment to my soul, that experience where I said I want to know God, that was my understanding. But what I found out as years went on that my knowing wasn't what I thought it was. And God wasn't what I thought God was, meaning there was such a I was in such a limited box, a little box. And I was looking at everything through a peephole. But as time has gone on, it expands and expands and expands. And I drew experiences to myself that supported that true de desire. Now, Jane talks about an experience she had when she was a little girl. When she was five years old, her mother was taken to a ward where she was put into isolation, in quarantine because she had tuberculosis. And in those days, that's what they did. And this was uh, in the 1930s. Her grandmother, who was married to a very traditional uh, fundamentalist minister, used to was raising her and used to sit her next to her at the piano and would play and sing hymns to her. And one of them was in the garden. And many of you remember that. And remember the line, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And after one time of playing it, little five-year-old Janie turned to her grandma and said, Grandma, God's gonna talk to me. And her grandma said, sure, she, sure he is, Janie, of course he is. Well, she, the problem was she didn't let go of that thought. And as she had that, that desire of her heart that was so strong, even at that early age, and she continued with it. And then when she reached a certain age, 
she still said, God's going to talk to me. And finally, I believe it was her father or maybe your mother said to her, no, that's those people in the Bible. Um, you're just supposed to uh, grow up and be a mother and be a wife and live a good life. And that's all God wants for you. Well, she was defiant. You talk about rebelling. She didn't go out and uh, uh, do what a lot of people do in rebelling. Her rebellion was, she said, no, I know God's going to talk to me. And she learned soon not to share that with people. But that desire was there in her heart. And when she was 12, her neighbor across the street, whose father was a minister of a, of a very um, traditional, a very um, fundamentalist church, invited her to come to a service. And her parents said, sure, yeah, you can go. And she went. And this is one of those churches that had altar calls. And so when the father of her friend said, and if you want to have a personal relationship with God, come down to the altar. She ran as fast as she could at the age of 12 down to the altar. She was the first one there. And he was a little dismayed because he didn't want to make waves with his neighbors. And he didn't really think a 12-year-old girl knew what that truly meant. But she was, again, defiant, so much so that he, when he took her back home, he said, you've got a very willful little girl, young girl. And But she knew. She said, no, I am ready. I'm ready to have a personal experience of God. As the years went on, she had opportunities to back this up with what we're going to call commitment. Desire has to be backed up with our will. Our desire has to be backed up with the commitment of our soul, which then keeps that energy moving. And her, her first time of experiencing this that she shared with us is when her mother gave her a book by Glenn Clark, I Will Lift Up Mine Eyes. And in that book, there were a couple of things that, three things actually, that, that really moved her energy forward. The first thing was, I believe the first lines of the book was that you can know God personally, God will speak to you. And she cried because this is the first time anybody had affirmed what she believed was true. And then later in the book, and she and her mother were studying this together, there was an opportunity to write, I believe, six checks. You're supposed to take six of your checks out of your checkbook and, of course, void them, but then write in uh, what you want from God. What do you want from the universe? And this is something in the 1940s that uh, is, is very advanced for today. Now, this, this book, my parents had it when I was growing up. So um, this is something that was studied all over the country at the time. And these six checks that she wrote, uh, her mother wrote checks for things like, I want a new car, I want this experience, I want that experience. But what Jane wrote was, I want to know God on the first check. I want to know God on the second check, all the way to the sixth check. That was her only desire. And she was making a statement to her own beingness, to the universe, that she had one true desire and she was willing to commit to it and let the rest of them go. Another thing that was in the book she shared was he suggested that if you want your life to change, write the statement, I will to will the will of God, I believe a thousand times. I could have this wrong. And she did. And she said it shifted her energy. It moved her and it made her more pur purposeful in her spiritual growth. My question to you is in this present lifetime, when did you set into motion your commitment to spiritual growth? When did you say, you know, I want something more? What was your desire thought? When Jane was five, she had a very primitive five-year-old understanding of this. Her understanding of he walks with me and he talks with me, by definition, is very, very basic. But the essence of it was from her soul. Was there a time when you were young, when you made that commitment? I remember having an experience like that when I was a teenager and I'd had this incredible opening experience with another teenager soul on a train coming back from a youth conference. And I, after that, this conversation, which opened me up, I stood between the cars of the train and I looked out on the West Texas sky and the desert and all the stars, like I'd never seen them before. And I, I made a commitment. When in your life have you made a commitment to your spiritual essence, to, to your desire of your heart. And were the words, I want to know God. I want to experience oneness. I want 
to grow spiritually, God will speak to me. And then Jane found out that the God who spoke to her was very much more expanded and different than the guy the little girl thought. And the speaking to her was also far greater and different than what she had in mind. What are the circumstances that led to your making this commitment to your being? And in our breakout groups on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 and Saturday at 11, uh, we may have an opportunity to share what our commitment was and when it was in our lives and to get back in touch with that that younger self that knew and wanted and 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 had that yearning and got in touch with that yearning that was placed in your heart at the very beginning of time then there's a second part of this setting this desire into motion and that is finding out and identifying all the things that are in the way. Somebody once said, your desires bring up what's in their way. And if you have a desire, then everything unlike it will come up. I wanna share a, a spiritual power tool this week. We're gonna skip ahead in the book a little bit. And it, it really speaks to this. It's called the spiritual iceberg. And it's on page 28. And in it, you'll see, this was an image that came into the meditation experience of Jane Hart many decades ago. And in it, she realized that the iceberg above the surface of the water was her conscious mind, what she was consciously aware of. The iceberg below the water, the nine tenths, was her subconscious. All of the database of all of the experiences that she'd had over eons and eons of time, not just in this lifetime. So she was nine tenths conscious, and one-tenth subconscious, and that all around was the water, the ocean of the infinite, and that the ultimate goal of this spiritual experience was to blend and merge with the infinite. And so when we get in touch with our desire, our soul desire, it's like heat and light come down from above and starts to dis dislodge chunks of the subconscious iceberg within us. So anything we're holding on to, any past memories or any beliefs or attitudes, any experiences that are holding us back from experiencing ourselves as a whole being will dislodge and rise to the surface of the awareness. If a chunk down here of this iceberg is dislodged, it floats up here so we can see it. And those are those Christmas presents that we get every day. Those are those opportunities for our souls to grow. And so the question is, what are you willing to let go of? What lesser ego desires so that you can grab hold of your spiritual, this one true greatest desire? These lesser desires sometimes show up as beliefs. They show up as um goals and uh, attachments to things. You know, people talk a lot about you should let go of all of your desires and, and people have misquoted the Buddha as saying you have, must let go of all of your desires. But what these teachers truly teach is that you shouldn't let go of the one desire, the one desire for your infinite consciousness, your infinite self. That one desire will move and work within your subconscious mind to to melt and generate a new energy in your life. So what are some of these that you can identify right now? And I'm going to invite you to journal them during the week. That is another spiritual power tool that I want to share on page 40, journaling questions, five journaling questions. And as you have these feelings or become aware of these limitations that you're holding on to, whether we thought they were necessary and good or whether they seem like limitations just journal these questions and see what you're willing to let go of and the fourth of the five questions is what is your soul trying to tell you and the fifth is if your soul were running things not your ego how would you handle this differently perhaps we'll have a chance to share those on tuesday thursday or saturday if you come to one of these groups what we're talking about here is your heart's desire. How strong does your heart's desire have to be to move you forward? 
your desire to move always has to be stronger than your desire not to move. It seems simple, but we can look within ourselves and ask ourselves, what is our desire? You know, we, we shared, and this is another spiritual power tool, the spiritual thermometer. And Jane wanted me to share with you today that the spiritual thermometer is not just used for our moods and our state of consciousness and energy, but this can also be used to answer the question, how strong is, the, is my desire for spiritual growth or the desire that I'm expressing here? And ask yourself, where am I? Is it just kind of a half-hearted, so-so? Yeah, I'll come to this Sunday thing and then I'll go off and I'll do the things I really want to do. Or is it a burning, deep desire? And the interesting thing is, you can decide. The purpose of the spiritual thermometer is to teach you that you have choice, that you can decide where you are ultimately. Maybe not in this very moment, but ultimately you can decide where you are in the spiritual thermometer and set into motion that desire becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. In order to really move, Jane once said, you have to be 80 to 90 percent invested in your desire to move. It has to be the biggest desire in your life. That way it can become strong enough so that when the other little desires start to sneak in, which they will, because desire brings up whatever's in its way, they will be canceled out. So those little desires start to sneak in and then you can let them go. How do you let them go go? If, I'm, if, I'm, if I've decided that I'm gonna move forward spiritually and I'm, I'm committed to this, of course, these other lesser desires come up. What do I do when I have that Christmas present and it's not anything I really wanted to look at? Jane once said, often the best thing to do is to imagine that dust, it's dust on your feet and you just shake it off. I heard her say that once. Just imagine that this, this uh, lesser desire or this negative state, ego state is just some dust and you just kick it off. Another thing that works for me is to say, I cast this burden onto my infinite self and I go free. Letting it go, making a decision to let it go. That's what works for me is to make a decision, make a commitment to releasing these things. Journaling it out, using those journaling questions that I was sharing on page 40, um, doing the, the spiritual work that you need to do. In future weeks, we're going to talk about the seven steps to successful life transitions, which is found toward the back of the book. And that's another method which you can jump ahead and really release anything that you're holding on to. Because what will happen is that you can cancel out these lesser desires with the flame of your true spiritual desire. And you can fan that flame of your one true desire within you because that center for enlightenment is in you. It is your responsibility to fan that flame. Perhaps today is the day that you can open up to that possibility, that new awareness of yourself. What I have found is that every time I make a commitment to my infinite self, to my spiritual growth, the outer circumstances of my life change. The inner circumstances of my consciousness change. I get back up from the universe. There's a deeper connection to the truth of your being that is awaiting your desire and commitment. And the Center for Enlightenment is here to encourage you. So what is your greatest heart's desire? Your greatest, your heart, every one of our hearts, no matter how we put language to it, desires to know the infinite self, to know ourselves as an infinite being. And that desire keeps on working within ourselves to awaken us to itself, to move us out of our limited beliefs and to open us up to the expanding possibilities that the universe has waiting for us. All the tools that you need for this are within you. All the talents and the abilities, the awarenesses and the love, most of all the love in your heart for your true and infinite self. These will all move you forth on your journey, you can tap that center for enlightenment within you. You are your own center for enlightenment. There is no authority figure here. 
the authority figure is the infinite self that we all share. You know, once I was having a problem with another individual and um, what came to me was this person is your infinite self. First, I didn't understand it, but I realized, no, everyone is here to teach me. Everyone is being used in cahoots with my infinite self. This center for enlightenment is within you always. Now, how do you access it? We'll talk more about meditation, daily meditation and commitment, patience, not expecting it to happen all at once. Jane has said many times, if somebody could pop you on the head and enlighten you, it would be worthless. Because the truth is that you wouldn't understand it. You wouldn't have the experience of growing into it. It wouldn't have any value to you. It's your perseverance. It's your patience. It's using your observer self every day, observing your thoughts and your mind and your feelings, journaling your questions using those five questions I was sharing. And most of all, forgiving, forgiving yourself when you see limitations and forgiving other people. All of this is within you. And the Center for Enlightenment is here to support you. Everything that Jane has created in these past decades has been to help humanity on this journey. And so as you work with these tools, know that you are capable and know that you are supported. So once again, what is your sincere heart's desire? How has that desire led you to this place where you are spiritually? And what things have happened along the way that have led to this desire to know yourself and to grow into your spiritual essence and to make that spiritual growth your priority. Well, I've talked a lot about desire, but there's something that backs up desire. A friend of mine shared with me this the statement that she uses to strengthen her commitment, which is, I use my will to back up my desire to grow. I use my will to back up my desire to get in touch with my infinite self, to quiet my mind. And this is the proper use of will. It's called commitment. And in a sense, we are kind of jumping through uh, a little ahead in the book. Chapter 4A is on commitment. And we'll get into that more at that time. But I think it's important for us to get in touch with it this second week. Because a commitment is your pledge that backs up the desire of your heart. It's that backup system. You can have fleeting desires, but when you continually recommit to your spiritual growth every day, as your desire gets challenged, as it definitely will, that's what brings your energy forward. And meditation as a daily practice is a part of it. Remember last week, we again popped to the back of the book, page 67, how to stay on the transformation track. And these eight instructions, these eight steps are there to help you to stay on the track of your transformation every day. These are a way to strengthen your commitment. Commitment is that tenacity of spirit that supports your soul's desire and will see you through to your goal, which is what? Which is awakening to your infinite self, the truth of your being. What happens when you make a commitment to becoming enlightened is that you've made a powerful request that resonates in your own beingness. It shakes you to your foundations and it resonates throughout the universe. What you're doing is making a profound decision that will restructure you, will, will reprioritize everything in your world. And that's what I found after I made that commitment when I was in the car with Jane, everything changed outside and inside in my life. What are the benefits to making this commitment? You'll find that your commitment empowers you. You'll find that it keeps you focused and it moves you forward. So when you have feelings or thoughts that are different than or in opposition to your commitment, don't be afraid of it. Don't shy away. Realize that's necessary. The first force of desire is always met with the second force of the resistance 
that comes up because your desire will bring up these things. Observe them. And as Jane was saying, imagine them as dust off your feet blowing away. I use the, the words, I cast this burden on my infinite self and I go free. And move into your awareness that this is a natural part of your process. So be patient and perseverance no matter what. Jane once said in a class that if you were going to polish your floor, you'd sweep it first. That if you didn't sweep your floor and put the liquid polish on top of it, it would embed the dirt. A lot of people want a spiritual solution, quick, uh, quick fix, um, a pseudo spiritual um, shortcut. But we have to do this inner work of releasing and the commitment is what gets us through this work. Remember that without a strong commitment, nothing can be accomplished. And it's your personal determination, what we call your will, that is your dividing, your driving force that propels you forward as you move towards your spiritual goal. Now, your commitment, how does it help you on your spiritual journey? I, I know every day of my life, I struggle with commitment. Every day, there's a moment during the day where I feel out of touch with it or something comes up that challenges my commitment. And then I have to remind myself that my inward journey has many steps to it, and I must be patient. It takes time. Once you make the commitment to know the truth of your being, you'll find that your life will support you and changes will happen to you to help you to grow into this goal the best way possible. After you pay attention to the deep desire of your heart, more than this third dimensional world, your commitment is the key to taking responsibility for your soul. Are you ready to make a commitment to your soul? Are you ready to back up your desire of your heart with your will? And one way that shows that up is, are you willing to meditate each day, five minutes a day? Doesn't have to be a big commitment. In fact, it's just like an exercise practice. You don't go to the gym the first day and lift 200 pound weights. You've got to start where you are. But the benefits, just as with physical exercise, start immediately and your life begins to change. As you're looking at your commitment issues, you can start to see as you observe yourself more and more of yourself. It's you expand. You expand your awareness of yourself. I'm going to ask you to take a look at what are some of the lesser commitments that have gotten in the way of your journey that have kept you from making progress. And one of, one of uh, those, some of them are, are distractions. One of those things might be those pastimes that we use, not just to relax and have recreation, but they become obsessive. You know the difference between a hobby and an obsession. We all have phones and there are a lot of fun things to do on the phones. When does that get in the way? And when is that just something we do to relax. So what are some of the escapes and the habits and the pastimes that you sometimes use to try to avoid your commitments? Realize that as you're moving forward on your journey, it isn't a straight line process. You aren't just going to cut through the water like a motorboat. You are going to tack back and forth more like a sailboat that is moving in a certain direction into the wind because the wind of your own resistance comes up. But you still, just as a sailboat can do, can make progress. You just have to redefine it and realize that you're going to move back and forth in the pairs of opposites. Be gentle with yourself. Be compassionate with yourself. Have mercy on yourself. As you do this work, don't have the will and the drive and the desire, but don't drive yourself with that will and desire in a way that's unkind to yourself. Your commitment requires recommitting moment by moment and day by day. Give yourself encouraging and affirming statements that you can use to keep yourself in alignment and attunement. 
you are supported. Know that too. You're not out there on your own. You are received. You are receiving spiritual support for your soul, even and especially when you most feel like you're alone. Ask for help. I always find that at the times I feel the most alone and the times when I feel like most out of tune is the time that when I ask, I'll look back on it and I see that's when everything shifted. Right after that, I didn't even realize it, but I got the answers I was looking for. That wise and courageous part of yourself will come forth to help you. Now, recognize as part of the journey, you will experience the resistance, you will resist your commitment and your desire. The old habits will surface in your awareness so that they can be overcome. This is a do-it-yourself process. You support your own soul, even though you get a lot of support from the universe. And the activity of making a commitment will shake out the unusable thoughts and patterns that are not supporting you. Commitment that you have on your spiritual journey is the most important thing that you can bring to bear to move you forward because without a strong commitment, nothing can be accomplished. So check in where you are today and ask yourself, where am I? How would I evaluate my commitment and desires? Perhaps use the spiritual thermometer and ask yourself, where am I in my commitment, my desire right now? How strong of a desire is there? And be honest with yourself. Maybe it's only a three or a four and then decide and make the commitment, I want a stronger desire. I wanna move my soul forward. I am ready to commit to the truth of my being and today is the day. Then journal about it, keep, pro keep progress, keep track of your progress in your journal. And although later as we, as we continue this process, we're going to get to the chapter 4A on commitment, you can just be aware that there is a little place to sign a commitment. I am ready to move into fourth dimensional consciousness, which is your infinite self. And whenever you're ready, sign that. You can wait until we reach that point in the book or you could do it now. No one's holding you back. Well, we're, we're, we want everybody to know that um, we have support groups, question and answers groups, where you can bring forth your questions. You can answer some of the questions that we talked about here today and some other ones, and really feel support for your soul on Tuesday and Thursday at 11, and Saturday at, I mean, Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m., and 11 o'clock on Saturday. And these are one-hour sessions where you can truly get the support for your soul, and there's more of a back and forth that goes on here. And now let's move into a time of meditation where we can access the truth of our being. And I want to say this on behalf of meditation. It isn't the subjective experience of being all blissed out that makes the difference. It is the commitment that you make, and you're just making the effort and taking that time each day that makes a much bigger difference. So don't judge yourself or have any performance anxiety around meditation, allow yourself to just move with it and know that the benefit is there. I notice that when I don't meditate, and that really doesn't happen much anymore, but the times that I haven't meditated, I notice a difference in the day, no matter what my experience has been. So close your eyes and just allow yourself to become aware of the light in the room, your breath, the sounds all around you as they disappear slowly. Feel the air upon your skin, the gentle pressure of the air. And as you quiet your mind and still your heart, The center for enlightenment is in you. This is the truth of your being. Your heart is yearning. Get in touch 
with that desire of your heart, that yearning of your heart that has always known that there's something more, that has never been satisfied with the material pursuits, that has always known, I am more than this, that the truth of my being has meaning, and get in touch with that desire that is already there innate within your heart What is your inner heart desiring and calling forth for you? If words arise that match this feeling of yearning and longing for the infinite, just let them rise. I want to know my true self in God. I want to know my infinite self. I desire to know the love of my being, the truth of my being. I want to awaken to the love of my heart as we move for a moment in silence.
And now as we bring ourselves back to the presence of this room, just become aware of the seat underneath you, the air upon your skin, the light in the room. And as you feel yourself fully grounded, you can open your eyes and notice that there are these wonderful souls that have supported you on your journey. They are here to support the Center for Enlightenment that is in you. And we're all here to support you as you move forward in your soul's growth. You can ask questions if you go onto the center's website that you can uh, send a message and we'll answer your questions. You can also ask questions on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday in our breakout question and answer groups. And we're here to answer those questions. And so you're not alone on your journey. Just as we support each other, we're supporting you. And we feel your support as you have made this commitment to your soul's growth. We want you to remember that uh, the question and answer sessions are coming up Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. There are self-study lessons on the website on about, oh gosh, 20 different topics that you can move through either in order or skip around. And they include videos, many dozens of videos of Jane Hart teaching her students these very principles so you can go deeper on your own. Also, um, the Center for Enlightenment is supported solely by the contributions of the people who are fed by these spiritual teachings. And there'll be a, um, a link put into the chat on, on the right that will uh, uh, enable you to give if you'd like, or you can go to the website for that. And somebody did mention, um, they didn't know how to get in touch with the chat. So what you do is you take your cursor to the bottom and what'll pop up is this little bubble that says chat, click on that, and then you will get your chat chat space visible for you. Anyway, thank you so much for being a part of this journey and making your commitment to the desire of your heart, using your will to back up that desire to support your soul. As, uh, as the chat says, experience your week with excitement and enthusiasm and look for the gifts of awareness. The Center for Enlightenment is in you. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, have a beautiful day.